Kaya, and good afternoon. I'm Margaret Allen. I'm the CEO and State Librarian at the State Library of Western Australia. And I come to you this afternoon from the lands of the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Welcome to this session uh, on copyright, copyright time for change in Australia. And it gives me really great pleasure to introduce uh, our next speaker, Ben Rice. Ben is uh, Executive Officer at the Australian Digital Alliance and the Australian Libraries and Archives Copyright Committee. He's a policy lawyer with experience in media content, classification, copyright and online safety. And we were really pleased to be able to appoint him um, recently to this role. Um, he brings with him a background in working in government relations, public policy and advocacy all things that are absolutely essential for us to sustain and maintain this long game around um, getting a copyright environment that's right for libraries and rights for, right for our users. So it gives me great pleasure now to hand over to Ben for his presentation. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, and thanks to Alia for, for having me. Thanks to the organisers of this. Um, I think it's been a really um, uh, good uh, and really interesting thought-provoking event so far. So I hope I can continue along with that. Um, I'd like to begin uh, today by paying my respects um, to the Ngunnawal people um, who are the traditional custodians of the land uh, in Canberra, um, where I am, where I'm joining you from today. Um, on behalf of the ADA and the ALACC, I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So as um, Margaret said, um, I'm the executive officer of the ADA um, and the policy and copyright law advisor of the ALACC. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the work that we do, um, both the ADA and the ALACC um, have been involved for a long time, um, decades now in, uh, in copyright reform debates and policy issues, um, representing a really wide range of members from GLAM institutions to schools, universities, to technology companies and, and disability organizations, as well as the individual members that we have as well. And what both organizations have been um, working towards as a big picture for the last sort of 20 years is a flexible system of copyright law in Australia that balances the rights of creators and users whilst at the same time encouraging more access to knowledge, culture, innovation, and education, and particularly in the library and archive sector. Which brings me sort of neatly to the theme of this talk, a time for change in the copyright system here, because uh, the government is currently working on introducing uh, copyright reforms that will have an impact on the library and information sectors here. Just exactly what the impact will be um, uh, and, and uh, how widespread those those impacts will be is, is still a little bit yet to be seen. We're currently in the process of, of working through with the government um, just what those reforms will look like. Um, but I thought I'd go into a bit of detail about the reforms uh, and, and talk about how they will um, impact the library sector. Um, but what I wanted to do first was sort of make a little bit of a case for exactly why it is time for change in Australian copyright law, why it's so important that the reforms announced by the government are passed um, by giving a bit of context um, to previous reviews that we've been going through um, for the last um, 20 years or so. So it will come as no surprise, I imagine, to the people that are joining us today, that Australian copyright law is quite problematic. I think as Victoria mentioned earlier this morning, copyright law is unbalanced here meaning that it leans in favour of protecting mostly large scale corporate interests as opposed to the rights of users and creators. It's inflexible in a lot of ways, meaning that it's difficult um, to adapt to changes in technology and the way people are using copyright material. And um, the, the rate of change in the copyright law here is slow. And the reforms that the government um, are currently proposing are the culmination of years of work um, by people in this sector, groups in this sector like Alia, um, and, and of course, people like Margaret who have been working on these important reforms um, for some time now. Now, a lot of the, the imbalance and inflexibility and the sort of glacial pace um, of change comes down to the fact that we don't have a system of fair use in Australia under our copyright law. 
and broadly, I'm sure everyone knows, but fair use is essentially the best practice model globally for a flexible future-proof copyright system. It allows uses of copyright material um, uh, as long as they're deemed fair and sets out criteria that courts um, are required to consider in determining this, such as harm to the copyright owner and the nature of the use. And of course, it's been adopted in jurisdictions um, that have sort of led the way in, in technological development um, and, and user rights, um, uh, in particular the US, Singapore, and South Korea, and, and Israel. Instead, what we have in Australia is a system of fair dealing, which is a closed system um, that essentially prohibits any use of material unless a specific exception uh, has been introduced to permit it. And as a result, new technologies and common behaviors can remain illegal here for decades. So one of the, the best examples of this absurdly is that it only became legal to use a VHS uh, to record television in Australia once specific um, legislation was introduced to make that lawful in 2006, um, which of course is around the same time that uh, people stopped using VHS and moved to DVD. So it's at this point I should probably state the obvious that um, uh, titling a speech a time for change um, might be a bit misleading because really the time for change was probably about 20 years ago um, when the, the rate of technological development sort of um, started increasing exponentially. And by this time, um, by this point in our um, in copyright reform cycles, Australia is, is way out of step with the rest of the world, unfortunately, and we're, we're quite behind in terms of the reforms that we need. So before going into some of the, the detail that, it, um, that the government is currently um, uh, proposing, which they're calling their copyright access reforms, I just wanted to set out a bit of context um, to illustrate just how overdue we are um, for some of these changes. Um, because after more than 20 years of reviews and inquiries and submissions and hearings by groups like the ADA and the ALCC, um, there are still um, some groups out there, rights owner groups, um, that with a straight face will tell you that the, current, the government's current proposals um, have come out of the blue with not enough time for consultation. Um, and I would like to prove um, today that that is in fact the opposite of what is true. <laughs> so there have been at least six or seven reviews over the last 20 years that have all concluded that Australia needs more flexible exceptions um, to ensure that our copyright laws keep pace um, with new technologies and behaviours um, across digital technologies, but also across um, the way libraries and archives, um, schools, education providers, um, individual users all engage with copyright material. So I'm not going to go through the findings of every single one of these, but I think it's worth pointing out that um, way back in, in 1998, uh, that the Copyright Law Review Committee um, proposed a flexible exception to accommodate new uses um, that might emerge with future technological developments. Um, what they came up with this was a model that, it, that was concise and sufficiently flexible to accommodate these new, um, these new uses, these new consumer behaviors and, and the new ways that people were engaging with material back in the late nineties. And it wasn't called a fair use exception when they came up with it um, due to the confines of the, the terms of reference that the CLRC was operating under. Um, but the model proposed by the committee was flexible and open-ended um, and was essentially a fair use exception. And in fact, um, many years later, when the ALRC published their copyright um, in the Digital Economy Report, um, the ALRC said it's interesting to reflect on whether Australia might have been in a better place to participate in the growth of the nascent digital economy had the CLRC's um, fair use exception been enacted in 1988. So I think there's a real question that we should be asking around the opportunity cost um, to the library sector. Um, to the grand sector, to the technology sector, to the education sector, um, the opportunity cost of not having these sorts of um, exceptions in place sooner. Um, a whole range of, um, of committees here and reviews um, going back to um, the implementation in 2004 of the Australia and US Free Trade Agreement, um, where the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties and the Senate Committee on the implementation of the Free Trade Agreement both um, recommended replacing um, our current system with a, with a US style um, um, flexible and open copyright exception system. Both of those um, uh, reviews and inquiries made recommendations and were sort of um, kicked down the line um, uh, in, in terms of the recommendations that they made. So the Attorney General's Department in 2005, again, a fair use review, um, and that's where we got um, uh, exceptions to parody and satire, format shifting, um, 
time shifting for personal use and of course section 208b um, which a lot of people I'm sure in the library sector will be um, very familiar with. And then going through, um, again, I won't go through all of these, but of course the ALRC's report in 2014, which recommended fair use, uh, and the 2016 Productivity Commission, um, which endorsed the findings um, of the ALRC as well, um, and proposed that if the government not go ahead with fair use, then at the very least um, they implement um, flexible dealing or, or fair dealing with library and I-5 use um, listed as one of the illustrative purposes there. So I think just looking back on the on the sheer bulk of reviews over the last 20 years, um, I think the case for reform has been thoroughly made out um, by people um, uh, uh, and it's a case that has been made out for, for a very long time. There's an economic case, there's a cultural case, there's an innovation case. Um, there are so many cases to be made in favor of flexible um, flexible exceptions that, that benefit um, people, um, users, and also um, the library and archive sector itself as well. So that sort of brings me around to the government's copyright access reforms, which are the reforms that we are currently working, um, working with the government on having introduced. So unfortunately, um, uh, the, the, this current set of reforms you know, aren't the wholesale large scale reforms that, that our sectors have been pushing for for the last 20 years. Um, it, it, instead, this package is more about tweaking around the edges that being said, though, there are some there are some really fantastic parts of the reforms that the government um, is proposing to introduce, and the reason that I that I want to highlight um, that these reforms are likely to be quite narrowly drafted it is just to illustrate how absurd it is that there continues to be such strong pushback, um, uh, mostly from these larger corporate rights owners groups um, that are sort of opposed to any change um, to copyright um, across the board, no matter how small. And conversely, um, you know, the authors and creators that, that I've spoken to about these reforms and talking to them about the benefits of these um, are really excited about the potential for, for the greater access, um, not only to their works, but to, to other works as well. Um, we talk about documentary filmmakers being able to access orphan works held in collections of libraries and archives. Um, you know, there are all of these fantastic possibilities. Um, that creators themselves are, are, are really keen to use and, and utilize in their work. Um, so unfortunately, it's just, um, again, it's coming back to this, um, uh, the, the imbalance there in, in, in copyright and, and the way that these larger, these larger voices have an outsized, um, yeah, an, an outsized voice in, in copyright reform debates. So, but just going back to the the access reform. So they were announced by the minister, Minister Fletcher, in uh, August last year. So almost a year ago now, um, uh, when the reforms were first flagged. And at the time, the government had cited COVID nineteen and the pandemic um, as one of the key prompts for the reform agenda, um, needing uh, prompting the need for for more digital access um, or for more online access to the collections held um, by libraries and archives, museums, galleries. Um, when physical access was um, was not available. Of course, um, this is something that, that the ADA and the ALS, ALCC um, and, and other groups have been have been talking to the government about um, for many, many years. Um, and it's sort of taken COVID in a lot of ways um, to take those sort of hypothetical problems with the closure of venues, um, uh, take those hypothetical problems and, and and actually show the practical impact of not having flexible exceptions that allow people to access the collections in, in libraries and, and archives. So these reforms represent a continuation of, of the copyright modernization consultation, and they're designed to, to finalize the government's response um, to the recommendations of the Productivity um, Commission's report in 2017. Um, so the government really hoping, I think in a lot of ways to sort of wrap up some of these um, um, these reviews um, in, into a package that they've presented now, which again, from our perspective, in some ways is, is rather disappointing um, in that we haven't got, um, uh, we haven't got the introduction of, of more flexible exceptions that we think would be, um, would go a long way to future-proofing the Copyright Act. 
um, what we do have with with this package is um, is reforms that will will go a long way to helping libraries and archives and the education sector in particular um, in, in the short term and to deal with those immediate problems that we're having um, uh, with access across all of those sectors. So I'll go into a bit of detail about the library and archives um, um, parts in particular, and then if we have time, I might try and cover off some of the, um, the other parts as well. But um, as most of you, I'm sure will know, many of the libraries and archives parts of the Copyright Act were developed um, uh, during a paper-based era. So um, some of them are original provisions from the 1968 um, Act. And really what that means is that they don't enable libraries in a lot of ways to flexibly respond um, and, and meet the demand for online services that we've had, um, particularly in the past 18 months. Um, but the, it's no surprise to anyone that the, the trend towards online access has been growing for a number of years. Um, that, won't be, that won't be a surprise. Um, but as I say, COVID has, has really, um, uh, has really been a prompt and, and has really sort of fast tracked a lot of that move, that move to online access. So one of the prime examples that, that we found um, uh, in terms of access is access to electronic works that libraries hold in their collections that can't be made available online, um, for example, because of the terms of an ebook license. Um, these sorts of restrictions in a lot of ways really unfairly disadvantage library users who can't visit a library in person. Um, and that could include people um, living in um, regional and, and remote areas of Australia, um, people with disabilities, um, and of course, obviously, um, in times of crisis, such as bushfires and, and the pandemic, when getting physical access to, to libraries is, um, is actually quite difficult, and in some cases, impossible. So through the access reforms, what the government is, is aiming to do is to open up access for the wider community, um, to a broad range of, of cultural and educational materials that are held in, in the collections of, of public libraries um, and also the national cultural institutions as well. Um, importantly, there will remain um, really substantial protections in place um, to protect the rights of, of copyright owners um, and to minimize subsequent infringements. And I think that's a point that's really worth um, emphasizing. So, the government's proposing to, to increase access in a couple of ways. Um, and the first way is to amend this section up on the slide there, 49.5a, which is one, um, one of the provisions um, that forms part of the document delivery part of the Act. So at the moment, um, there are really limited types of material that fall under this provision, um, and electronic materials are, are only available to be, um, to be viewed within the premises of a library. So it really limits um, not only what can be what can be shared, but how it can be shared as well. And actually, the government's proposing to extend this this section forty nine five a um, to cover all types of copyright material, um, including audiovisual material uh, and unpublished materials as well. Um, whether or not they're they're in an electronic form, so um, if they're in hard copy, um, then a library will be able to digitize those and make them available um, online, both. Um, on site and off site, so providing online access, um, which we think is a really important part of the bill in terms of um, ensuring equitable access to people who, um, for, for whatever reason, aren't able to physically um, physically attend a library for the purpose of, of, um, of their document delivery. So the amended section again will, will mean that will mean that libraries are able to provide more. Um, access to the collections, but at the same time, providing um, protections for, um, for the rights of copyright owners. So some of the protections um, uh, that have been flagged uh, include that the use um, not be inconsistent with the terms of any direct license or agreement. Um, this, of course, raises a whole bunch of questions around um, uh, whether or not the terms of a, of a license um, can override um, rights that are granted under the Copyright Act but that's sort of a, a separate discussion that the government isn't proposing to um, address directly in this package of reforms. So I might um, leave that there, but certainly if there are any questions on, on how that would um, impact contractual um, 
uh, the, the issue of copyright and contract, I'm, I'm certainly happy to come back to that. Um, some of the other protections include uh, making sure that a, a digital copy isn't commercially available within a reasonable time at an ordinary price. Um, so that applies to physical material. Um, if it is possible to get a, um, say for example, an ebook um, that's available, um, uh, then a library would have to um, would have to go down that route instead of um, in, instead of uh, supplying the document through the document delivery provisions. And then including as well reasonable steps um, to mitigate against copyright infringement. So this could be uh, anything from ensuring that only library users, registered library users, um, are able to access the document delivery services, um, uh, making sure that documents are able to be viewed for a limited time only, um, that there's a one in one out um, system, as would be the case with a, with a physical copy. Um, uh, and then including things like watermarks or, or low resolution copies that I know a lot of institutions uh, are already doing. And just quickly, I'll add as well there that, um, that the amendments will extend as well to the preservation um, uh, um, preservation exceptions, which is really important for the, the archive sector. So making preservation and research copies available um, to be accessed online, um, both inside um, and offside as well, um, which is really important. The second part of the libraries and archives reforms um, that are being discussed at the moment um, are expanding section 49 and, and 50 um, of the interlibrary loans and document delivery parts of the act um, and uh, expanding the purposes for which um, someone can request material um, under those provisions. So currently, as I'm sure everyone knows, but the, the document delivery and interlibrary loan provisions um, only allow libraries um, to supply material if the material is requested by a user for the purposes of their research or study. Um, and there are also a number of um, burdensome administrative requ requirements that libraries have to follow under the current provisions. So the government's proposing to extend these sections um, to cover all types of copyright material, um, again, including audiovisual materials, so videos, uh, videos, music, podcasts, those sorts of materials. Um, and they're also planning on extending um, the purposes for which people can request material to private and domestic use. So there's been some um, question about, um, from, a, from pr a practical perspective, um, what would qualify as, as a person's research or study when they're, um, uh, when they're requesting material. Um, and so by expanding this to private and domestic use, the idea is to clear up um, any of those confusions and just expand um, the purposes for which someone might be able to request um, material from a library. And again, um, there'll always be protections in place for copyright owners. So um, the supply of material will be subject to a commercial availability test um, if more than a reasonable portion is requested. Um, and uh, the person requesting a copy um, will still be required to make some sort of declaration that they only intend to use the work for, for the purpose of research or study. Um, or their own private um, domestic, sorry, for their own private um, research. Some of these, um, some of these obligations and, and formalities that, that currently exist that are that are really um, administratively burdensome um, are also being proposed to be removed. Um, and I know, um, uh, in particular, uh, the last one there, destroying electronic copies after the communication is a bugbear of, of many people um, in the sector and it's just a, um, a requirement that, that no longer really makes sense um, in, in practice. Um, the way people are, are communicating materials, the way email works <laughs> um, or the way the document delivery is working um, through the interlibrary loan systems um, that libraries operate, um, it's just no longer practical in the modern, the modern age. I'll just leave this here, um, happy to come back to it, but we might skip over the contractual override um, uh, and, and go straight to Wortham Works, because I think this is um, one of the parts of the bill that particularly for the, um, the national cultural institutions, but also for public libraries have um, a pretty substantial impact. Um, and that's this limited liability scheme for Wortham Works. So um, again, I'm sure that everyone already knows this, but just in case, um, Often, an orphan work just means any copyright material um, where the author is unknown or can't be found. 
Um, and what this does is create issues um, for um, for people who want to use um, an orphaned work um, material that is orphaned. Um, and that's just because you can't go and, and ask the owner for permission um, to use the work. Um, and so technically, um, under our current law, um, it would be an infringement to use um, to use that material. So the idea with the uh, with the orphan work scheme is to allow um, wider uses of these orphan works by establishing a scheme which will limit um, limit the liability of the institution um, and individual users um, for using these works, provided that a reasonably diligent search um, has been conducted by the person by by the person wishing to use the material. Um, and that's a diligent search for the copyright owner. Limited liability in this um, case means that if a person later comes forward claiming to be the copyright owner of an orphan work, um, the person who used the work can't, um, can't later then be, be held liable for that use. Um, instead, what will happen is that um, a person will be required to either stop using um, the copyright material um, or agree with the copyright owner on the terms of further use. Um, so one of the examples of this could be um, uh, a piece of material um, from a library collection uh, where the author is unknown, um, but is still potentially within copyright. A person comes along, uses that on their personal website or uses that for a, um, some sort of marketing material or, or uses it in a, in a documentary that they're making. Um, uh, a copyright owner could later come forward and say, I'm the creator of this, um, you know, here's some evidence of that. Um, and the person using that material would have to um, would have to stop using that where it was practical to do so. There are still some questions around, um, uh, for example, the, the, the documentary um, example, uh, if a person, um, it becomes quite difficult to remove a, a, a single piece of material from a documentary. Um, and so there is, there'll be ways to work around that, but, but a lot of that will come out in the detail um, of the bill and, and will be worked out through guidelines with the, with the sector. The other part um, of the guidelines as well that we would, um, that are still to be determined are, are these guidelines for what would constitute um, a reasonably diligent search in terms of looking for a copyright owner. Um, the general feeling is that um, it will be quite context specific, um, depending on the type of material that's being used. Um, uh, in the case of ephemera, for example, um, internet memes, um, pictures downloaded from Google, that sort of thing, um, a reasonable diligent search might just be um, a, a quick Google search of, of similar images um, uh, being used on, on someone's personal blog. Um, but then a more substantial use, so the use of an orphan work in a, in a documentary, for example, um, would be um, sort of a, a more significant use of the work, and so would require a more, a more significant um, search to be conducted. But again, um, all of this is, is still to be sort of worked out in guidelines that, that all of the sectors involved, so the grant sector um, and, and the education sector and rights owner groups um, will be involved in, in creating as well. And one of the parts of this is that um, that uh, an orphan works limited liability scheme would be delayed um, delayed by twelve months um, uh, to allow the sectors to, to come up with these guidelines together. This um, provision here is is more um, intended is more aimed at um, uh, at library and archive users, so people accessing um, materials. Um, what this will do is introduce a, a standalone fair dealing exception to allow um, uh, the use of quotation of copyright material uh, to support intellectual commentary and, and public interest or personal research. Um, and the exception will permit quotation from any copyright material for the purposes of explanation, illustration, authority, and homage, um, provided that the copyright material has been, um, has been, the author has been clearly attributed um, and there are a limited number of circumstances um, where that material can be used. So uh, it can be used by a library or archive, um, and that could be in promotional material um, or um, website material um, or, or things um, put up in, in the library, or it could be a person, uh, an individual who's either conducting their own research or conducting research um, for their education 
there will be um, uh, fairness factors that will apply to this as well, um, similar to the fairness factors that are set out for, um, for research and study um, that will apply to the purpose and character of the use, so what the material is being used for, the nature and type of the material itself, so um, what is being copied, and the amount and substantiality of the material as well, so how much is being copied and, and what it's being used for. And just quickly, there are a couple of other amendments. I won't go into detail about all of these because I'd like to leave um, some time for questions. But um, importantly on this slide um, uh, for the library and archive sector is the clarification of the application of section 200 AB. Um, so that's the flexible, fair, the flexible dealing um, exception that was intended to have some of the benefits of fair use when it was introduced in 2006. And what we found, um, um, practically speaking, is that it hasn't had that effect. Because, it's, um, because of the way it's structured, because of the way the provision has been drafted in terms of the language that is used, um, as well as sub the, one of the subsections of the section itself, um, which creates confusion where it says, um, this section can't be relied upon um, if a person is relying on another section of the act as well. Um, so we're really hoping that the government will, um, will clarify um, uh, the operation of section 200 AB um, uh, and how that would work for, for library um, users as well. The government statutory licensing scheme, um, I won't go into any detail here, but just to say that um, uh, that they're, the government's planning to pro um, proposing to extend collective licensing arrangements um, to cover uh, communication and, and performance of copyright material. Um, and that will have a, a, a fairly substantial impact on uh, institutions that um, such as archives that, that receive a lot of government correspondence. And just um, to leave on a note, I know I've harped on a lot about um, fair use um, this afternoon, but I think um, just a couple of issues that are, that are outstanding um, from our perspective, um, the ADA and the ALACC um, will continue to push for, for fair use um, style exceptions, and more flexible copyright exceptions in Australia. We think that um, for all of our sectors, for all of our members, um, a, a fair use um, provision um, is the only way to future-proof the Copyright Act and to make sure that um, as uh, time and technology go on, um, uh, that the way people are using copyright material and that the law is able to keep up with that. Again, um, nothing in there about restrictions on contracting out. Um, and then nothing in there for the use of, of text and data mining. Um, and I just should just clarify that this um, no exception for the use of orphan works. There's a, a technical um, difference there between an exception and a, and a limited liability scheme. And a limited, limited liability scheme like the one that the government is proposing is just a bit more restrictive. Um, an open-ended exception um, would give uh, more flexibility uh, and more freedom for users to, to use orphan works. Um, uh, in their collections and, and in their, their own works as well. And that's everything I have. So hopefully there are some um, questions and if not, I'm happy to keep talking about copyright. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Um, yes, useful reminder that this hasn't come out of the blue, that there is, um, is and has been a really recurrent theme emerging from you know, the numerous, the numerous reviews that government has invested in, um, of course, fair use being one of those uh, recommendations that we're still not there. Nevertheless, there's plenty to like in this round of um, reforms and I think um, quite a bit of benefit to um, libraries in Australia and educational institutions. But... I just wondered, you know, I'm struck that there's no movement on text and data mining and we can look to the UK and Europe and other jurisdictions where text and data mining is, even, even in environments that don't have fair use, you know, fair dealing, there's exceptions. What, what do you think it's going to take to get that, that message through to government? What, what's standing in the way? Have you got any sense of that? Yeah, so I think... Um... I think the way that the government has looked um, at the, the access reforms that they've proposed is um, is at a, at a high level um, that they're reluctant to go about 
wholesale um, change to the Copyright Act, like introducing fair use. I think we've seen that over, over 20 years. Um, and I don't know what it will take to, to get something like that through um, um, across either side of politics at the moment. Um, and so I think what there's been instead is a desire to address um, the really upfront problems that people have faced um, during during the COVID pandemic, um, when people haven't been able to access material in, in cultural collections, um, when people have been homeschooling and there are suddenly all of these questions around what material can be used um, uh, in, in Zoom teaching and, and, and how the copyright exceptions that apply to, to schools and libraries um, uh, in, in the real world, for lack of a better phrase, um, apply in the virtual world as well. Um, but what I keep coming back to um, is the opportunity cost of not acting on a lot of these exceptions and text and data mining is one of them. There is an opportunity cost um, uh, of not having an exception that um, sufficiently allows for the development of AI um, and machine learning technologies in Australia. Um, and there, there will come a time where, um, and I think probably the time has already passed us, but um, where, um, many, many other jurisdictions around the world will be much more favored by technology companies. Obviously the US is, um, is of course, the, is always going to be the, the favored place for, for startups. But I think even now, um, if you're looking at, at setting up um, uh, a technology startup that is gonna be using, that's a copyright material heavy and um, a product that you're using, and you're looking at, at whether you'd um, launch in, in, say, for example, Singapore or Australia, I think it's a no-brainer that Singapore is the more friendly jurisdiction mm -hmm. um, uh, in terms of their copyright regulation um, to open up it. Um, and so I think more and more we're going to start seeing that opportunity cost um, translate to um, these really, these sectors that the government um, says are quite important to it, such as, you know, AI and, and these technology sectors that the government says we want to be a leading digital economy by 2030. Well, I think it's time for them to put their money where their mouth is a little bit and and, um, and give us the regulatory environment to allow that to happen. Mm, okay. Earlier on in um, Victoria Owen's presentation, a question came up about controlled digital lending. And I haven't had a chance to actually look at the proposed draft, but does the ability to digitise physical copies and make them available under certain circumstances, does that open the door to control digital lending in your view? The barrier here has always been that we, or well, seems to have been that we don't have fair use and it's something that's possible under fair use. Now, fair dealing does give exceptions in certain circumstances. So just wondering whether this opens the door for the Australian Library community to look at controlled digital lending. Yeah, it, I, I don't think it does. Um, and I think that's just because of the protections that are being put in place for, for copyright owners. So, um, uh, for example, the requirement that, that if a library is going to, to digitise some of its material and make it available online for, for document delivery, um, that there are these protections. So um, the commercial availability test is a, is a good one. Um, if a user can acquire um, the same material um, uh, in a digital format at a reasonable at a reasonable price, then um, a library wouldn't be able to um, uh, to provide the user with that. Um, but if it's not about, if it's not available in a digital yeah. form, if it's only yeah, available, and, so, and there is lots of material in our collections that you cannot buy a physical copy of, let alone a digital copy. Yeah. Um, so that's you know I'm just wondering, does it open a slim door at least for um, those willing to trial it and see what the implications are um, when this becomes active. So I think yeah, well, in that an way, interesting it's... conversation to have. Yeah, certainly it will mean it will mean you know greater access to to those those materials and, and especially those materials that that can't be um, that can't be obtained otherwise, like material that you, you can't buy commercially. Yeah. Okay. And um, just a question: When do these? When do we expect this consultation process to be over? When do we expect the um, bill to be introduced? Yeah, it's a sort of million-dollar question at the moment. Um, um, so the reforms were announced in August. So it's coming up to a year now um, since uh, since the minister announced announced the um, the copyright access reforms. Um, 
we're really hoping that that certainly in the next month or so that we'll we'll have some movement. Um, COVID is really um, COVID in the in the first part. Sorry, the, the the later part of last year and the first part of this year um, made things quite difficult to um, to get things like copyright reform um, priority and the attention that they need. Um, but I think what we're finding is that um, this COVID's not going anywhere. And um, the Victorian lockdown was a great example. Um, the, the New South Wales lockdown is another example of, um, of times where for the foreseeable future, um, there are going to be these um, stop, start, open and closed um, um, uh, phases and, and times that we go through. So I think now is a, is a really important time to remind the government that, that these reforms are critical <laughs> for the library and archive sector and for the education sector in terms of um, keeping material available. Mm. I guess we've got to um, try and keep the pressure on to get it through before we go to an election, wherever Absolutely. Whatever that yeah. might be. Otherwise, we start from scratch again. So um, yeah. the history of legislative reform. So. Okay. Okay, well, um, I think that we might wrap up the session now and I would like to thank Ben for his um, presentation and um, I'd encourage everyone to subscribe to the newsletter of the Australian Libraries and Archives Copyright Committee if you haven't done so, that will help keep up to date and a bit of a plug for their training program here. Um, the committee does great work and it's really important that we have voices, we have people in the sector that advocate and keep that advocacy going. The rights holders have huge dollars to put behind their campaigns. We have a few pennies and lots of compelling arguments and active voices. So I'd encourage everyone to get involved um, and add their voice to, to that campaign. So thank you, everyone. We're going to take a short break now and uh, then we're going to another panel session. Um, we reconvene on the hour. So. Thanks, Ben. Thanks to everyone. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks, everyone, for having me.